If I told you that a secret cabal of powerful elites engaged in a conspiracy to change election rules, laws, to manipulate information in order to prevent the victory of Donald Trump, well, I'd get banned from YouTube. I mean, they'd probably take this video down. Twitter would probably suspend me for a day. And Facebook has already restricted my page for unknown reasons. So I'm not saying that. Time magazine is, and I'm 100% serious. An article titled the, Se- titled the Secret History of the Shadow Campaign that Saved the 2020 Election. Time magazine literally describes it as a cabal of powerful elites across industry and ideology engaging in a conspiracy to manipulate information, to suppress information, to change the rules, to ensure the proper outcome is delivered. The proper outcome. Some people have said, wow, I can't believe they're saying the quiet part loud. And I'm just saying, I mean, it's brazen, but they're admitting it. You know, look, before the election, I had been saying that Democrats were rigging the game. And I'm not I'm not saying anything illegal occurred. What I'm saying is there's rules in an election and the Democrats changed those rules in many ways that favored them. If we're running in a race and then you make a rule that, you know, imagine a horse race. okay? if you make a rule saying that your horse is allowed to leave the, you know, the stable or whatever, or whatever it's called, the the holding pen. They're allowed to start running five seconds before everyone else. I'd say, dude, you're rigging the game so you can win. You're changing the rules. You can't call it breaking the rules when the rules were changed to benefit them. So I'd been saying that they've been rigging this. Well, they're coming out and admitting it. It is one of the most shocking things I have ever read. They claimed in the media that they needed mail-in voting because of COVID. In fact, mail-in voting, start, voting started getting implementing, implemented well before COVID. October 2019, for instance, in Pennsylvania, when they violated, in my opinion, the constitution of the state and then eventually the constitution of the federal government. The constitution of Pennsylvania provides for how absentee ballots can be delivered. Uh, or, 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 I'm sorry, how absentee ballots can be cast as a narrow ruling. Republicans and Democrats changed the rules to allow mail-in voting. But at first, they wanted to create universal absentee. When they realized it would violate the Constitution, they stopped. They, they, they were actually planning on changing and, and amending the Constitution. Instead, they just altered some language in the, in the bill to make it legal. When they were sued over this, a judge said that this would go to a higher court, it was being appealed, and that this lawsuit would likely win on the merits that it was unconstitutional to change this law. At the higher court in Pennsylvania, they dismissed it on standing. Uh, I'm sorry, I think they dismissed it on latches, actually, saying that the lawsuit was brought too late. The bill had already been passed and it's been way too late. Not merit. Meaning not only did a secret cabal, according to Time magazine, conspire to prevent Trump from winning, but the rule changes that were brought about were unconstitutional. And many Republicans assert that as much. In order to change the rules of an election, a state legislature must approve it. But they say around 24 states change the election rules without permission from their legislature, notably the key states that Donald Trump needed in order to win. They're just telling us this. Let's read this article. I'm going to go through the whole thing. Before we do, my friends, go to TimCast.com and become a member, please. We are creating members only content as uh, we're putting together this website, we're going to be expanding because I will likely be banned. I mentioned my Facebook's already restricted. You hear me say this in almost every video, so I apologize, but it's true. They're telling us now what I would get banned for saying. They are publishing in the news that when I would have said something similar a month ago, they would have banned my channel. And now they're just saying it. You see how the game is rigged. Over at TimCast.com, we can say, for the most part, whatever we want. So we swear, we talk about conspiracies. We have a a new segment, it's about 20 minutes long, talking about Navy technology. They've reported engineering the fabric of reality. So there's a lot of really interesting conversations. We talk about trafficking and things YouTube doesn't want us to talk about. In the event I do get banned on YouTube, which seems likely, we will still have content up at TimCast.com and we will still be expanding new websites and, 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 and new shows, etc. So go there. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. So long as I am able to produce on YouTube, I will. 
Let's read the story from Time magazine. The secret history of the shadow campaign that saved the 2020 election. A weird thing happened right after the November 3rd election. Nothing. The nation was braced for chaos. Liberal groups had vowed to take the streets, planning hundreds of protests across the country. Right wing militias were girding for battle. In a poll before Election Day, 75% of Americans voiced concern about violence. Instead, an eerie quiet descended. As President Trump refused to concede, the response was not mass action, but crickets. When media organizations called the race for Joe Biden on November 7th, jubilation broke out instead. As people thronged cities across the U.S. to celebrate the democratic process that resulted in Trump's ouster. Let me just stop right there. First point. These people who are celebrating were jumping up and down in close, uh, close proximity to each other, many taking off their masks and sharing champagne bottles. But we were told throughout the year that COVID was dangerous and we couldn't do this. When Trump supporters went out and protested the lockdowns, they were called, you know, they were called really, really awful things. Uh, certain words I can't say on, on YouTube. You see how the censorship works. They were called horrifying names. They, they said that they were threatening the safety and security of the country and that they'll go down in history as awful people. But when the left went out and protested, it was defended. Studies emerged saying that the, the Black Lives Matter actually reduced the spread of COVID. Special rules were given to the left to espouse their ideology and special rules enacted to stop Trump supporters. And they admit all of it. They say a second odd thing happened amid Trump's attempts to reverse the results. Corporate America turned on him. Hundreds of major business leaders, many of whom had backed Trump's candidacy and supported his policies, called on him to concede. To the president, something felt amiss. Quote, it was all very, very strange, Trump said on December 2nd. Within days after the election, we witnessed an orchestrated effort to anoint the winner, even while many key states were still being counted. In a way, Trump was right. Are you ready for this, my friends? Quote, there was a conspiracy unfolding behind the scenes, one that both curtailed the protests and coordinated the resistance from CEOs. Both surprises were the result of an informal alliance between left wing activists and business titans. The pact was formalized in a tense, little noticed joint statement of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and AFL CIO published on Election Day. Both sides would come to see it as a sort of implicit bargain inspired by the summer's massive, sometimes destructive racial justice protests in which the forces of labor came together with the forces of capital to keep the peace and oppose Trump's assault on democracy. The handshake between business and labor was just one component of a vast cross-partisan campaign to protect the election, an extraordinary shadow effort dedicated not to winning the vote, but to ensuring it would be free and fair, credible and uncorrupted. For more than a year, a loosely organized coalition of operatives scrambled to shore up America's institutions as they came under simultaneously simultaneous attack from a remorseless pandemic and an autocratically inclined president. Though much of this activity took place on the left, it was separate from the Biden campaign and crossed ideological lines with crucial contributions by nonpartisan and conservative actors. The scenario, the shadow, uh, the, the scenario, the shadow campaigners were desperate to stop was not a Trump victory. It was an election so calamitous that no result could be discerned at all. A failure of the central act of democratic self-governance that has been a hallmark of America since its founding. Their work touched every aspect of the election. They got states to change voting systems and laws and helped secure hundreds of millions in public and private funding. They fended off voter suppression lawsuits, recruited armies of poll workers, and got millions of people to vote by mail for the first time. I'll pause here. They say the goal wasn't to stop a Trump. They said that they were not desperate to stop a Trump victory. They wanted to make sure there was no situation where there was no result at all, where we wouldn't know who the winner was. That's a lie. Uh, the left was not advocating to prevent an, an election where we didn't know who the winner was. I mean, you could say that's sort of the result, the, 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 the goal, but they literally say they were changing voting systems. They were trying to get people to vote by mail. The vote by mail that came in at four in the morning in all of these jurisdictions was like 95 percent for Joe Biden. So forgive me if I am of the opinion that the evidence suggests they were seeking to stop a Trump victory. They go on to say they successfully pressured social media companies to take a harder line against disinformation and use data driven strategies to fight viral smears. How would that have prevented an election where no one knew what the winner was? Stopping people from learning 
about the Hunter Biden story before the election. They did that. They suppressed the story. And then after the election, they admitted it was real. What, what, what does that have to do with anything? All that did was help Joe Biden. They say they go on. They executed national public awareness campaigns that helped Americans understand how the vote count would unfold over days or weeks, preventing Trump's conspiracy theories and false claims of victory from getting more traction. You see, they were trying to prevent Trump from winning. They go on to say after Election Day, they monitored every pressure point to ensure that Trump could not overturn the results. The untold story of the election is the thousands of people of both parties who accomplished the triumph of American democracy at its very foundation, says Norm Eisen a prominent lawyer and former Obama administration official who recruited Republicans and Democrats to the board of the voter protection program. For Trump and his allies were running their own campaign to spoil the election. The president spent months insisting that mail ballots, mail ballots were a Democratic plot and the election would be rigged. His henchmen at the state level sought to block their use, while his lawyers brought dozens of spurious suits to make it more difficult to vote. An intensification of the GOP's legacy of suppressive tactics. Now, I want to point something out. If you're on the right, you can clearly see this as an attempt to stop Trump from winning. If you're on the left, they say it's an attempt to protect the integrity of the election. The reality is it was about power for both sides. And the reality is Time magazine said a cabal. I'm not kidding. They actually say the word cabal conspired to change the rules. I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm not OK with that. I am absolutely not OK with that. We have rules. We agree to the rules. We play the game. The Democrats and Republicans together changed the rules to prevent Trump from winning. The will of the people was Donald Trump. They did everything in their power to make sure that did not happen. Now, in the end, for a variety of reasons, Joe Biden got more votes. There's some interesting video emerging that maybe we'll get into later as this evidence uh, starts to come out that corroborates some of the claims made by poll uh, by uh, vote tabulation watchers, observers that call into question a lot. We still don't have definitive evidence, so I'm going to refrain from saying too much. But I have personally seen some of these videos and I find them to be, well, it's nightmarish to say the least. What I can tell you is I'm shocked Time Magazine published this. And well, let's read more. They say the democracy campaigners watch with alarm. Every week we felt like we were in a struggle to try and pull off this election without the country going through a real dangerous moment of unraveling, says former GOP rep Zach Womp, a Trump supporter who helped coordinate a bipartisan election protection council. We can look back and say this thing went pretty well, but it was not at all clear in September and October that it was going to be the case. This is the inside story. Here we go. Of the conspiracy. Do you know what a conspiracy is? Conspiracy typically works, uh, uh, is defined as people, com- con- you know, uh, working in secret to engage in some kind of outcome. And it typically refers to a crime. They say it's the conspiracy to save the 2020 election based on access to the group's inner workings, never before seen documents and interviews with dozens of those involved from across the political spectrum. It is the story of an unprecedented, creative and determined campaign whose success also reveals how close the nation came to disaster. Every attempt to interfere with the proper outcome of the election was defeated. Proper outcome? What does that mean? Proper outcome? You see? says Ian Basson, co-founder of Protect Democracy, a nonpartisan rule of law advocacy group. But it's massively important for the country to understand that it didn't happen accidentally. The system didn't work magically. Democracy is not self-executing, self-executing. That's why the participants want the secret history of the 2020 election told. Even though it sounds like a paranoid fever dream, a well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies working together behind the scenes to influence perceptions, change rules and laws, steer media coverage and control the flow of information. They were not rigging the election. They were fortifying it. And they believe the public needs to understand the system's fragility in order to ensure that democracy in America endures. Enough said. My friends, it goes without saying. Powerful elites working behind the scenes to change the rules and the laws, to manipulate the flow of information, to change your perception, is the opposite of democracy. It is what we have seen from fascistic and authoritarian regimes throughout history. And they're telling they're telling us this. Why? Well, they're getting out in front of it. They're framing everything in a very positive way. 
They're telling you it wasn't about Trump, but we know it was about Trump because they said they were trying to stop Trump. They were trying to stop Trump's conspiracy theories. They were fighting to stop Trump. But then they, they lie. The goal of this is to make sure that you believe the presumably criminal conspiracy. OK, they call it a conspiracy. Sure. To assume that these actions were noble and just. It's to write in the history books that those that subverted our rules and changed our laws to rig an election, they did it for good reasons and you should like them. It's like having someone take over your country and then tell you they're the liberators. It's like the United States invading Iraq saying we will be welcomed as liberators, liberators, and then having the people reject us and fight us at every turn. It's almost like it's propaganda. If we're engaging in a free and fair election, this means that one side does not conspire to change the rules. It doesn't matter who you wanted to win. I, if, if Joe Biden won fair and square, I'm totally fine with it. But he didn't. And they're telling us this. I'm not exaggerating when I read you this. I read you this verbatim. A well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies, working together behind the scenes to influence perceptions, change rules and laws, steer media coverage, and control the flow of information. That's how they define it. That's not rigging the election, they say. It's fortifying it. If you steer media, media coverage and control the flow of information, you're rigging the system. If someone doesn't know how to properly win a game and you are feeding key information to their opponents, you're rigging the game. Remember when Bernie Sanders was going to be debating Hillary Clinton and CNN gave Hillary Clinton's people questions in advance? Well, that was called rigging. When information is provided to some people and not others, when certain information is restricted, yeah, I'd call that rigging the system. They're calling it fortifying because they did not want Trump to win. To them, they were defending the system from Trump's fascism. The architect, they say, is Mike Podhorzer, who became, they say, uh, well, the architect. In fall of 2019, Mike Podhorzer became convinced the election was headed for disaster and determined to protect it. This was not his, not his usual purview. For a quarter century, he's a senior advisor uh, to the president of the AFL-CIO, the nation's largest union federation. You know what I love? The pipe fitters who endorsed Joe Biden. And then Joe Biden came and shut down Keystone, and now they're, they're crying. They supported this. The unions supported this. They talked about endless you know, strategy, political strategy, etc. They go on to say, Trump's election in 2016 credited in part to his unusual strength among the sort of blue collar white voters who once dominated the AFL-CIO, prompted Podhorzer to question his assumptions about voter behavior. He began circulating weekly number crunching memos to a small circle of allies and hosting strategy sessions in D.C. But when he began to worry about the election itself, he didn't want to seem paranoid. It was only after months of research that he introduced his concerns in his newsletter in October 2019. The, use, the usual tools of data analytics and polling would not be sufficient in a situation where the president himself was trying to disrupt the election, he wrote. You see what they said? They said it wasn't about Trump, but Trump was disrupting the election. How was Trump disrupting the election? Trump was working with his people and his campaign to spread information. They thought, let me just put it simply. If you hate Trump, you'll love that they did this. If you like Trump, you hate that they did this. The reality is, to varying degrees, they were both doing similar things. Unfortunately, Donald Trump wasn't doing nearly as much as they were, the Democrats and their allies. The rules were being changed. The media was being manipulated. Groundbreaking stories about Hunter, uh, groundbreaking, earth shattering is probably the right way to put it. Stories about Hunter Biden were suppressed and called fake news by NPR. Twitter actually banned the sharing of vital information. Many people polled after the fact by multiple agent, uh, uh, agencies said that if they had known about Hunter Biden, they would not have voted for Joe. Social media companies sought to suppress this information. And we now know Time magazine is straight up saying it was a conspiracy. The alliance. Securing the vote. The first task was overhauling America's bulky election infrastructure in the middle of a pandemic. That's not true. Mail-in voting changes came in Pennsylvania back in October of 2019. Interesting timing. 
For the thousands of local, mostly nonpartisan officials who administer elections, the most urgent need was money. They needed pro- pro- uh, protective equipment like masks, gloves, and sanitizer. They needed to pay for uh, to pay for postcards, letting people know they could vote absentee or in some states to uh, to mail ballots to every voter. They needed additional staff scanners. In March, activists appealed to Congress to steal co- uh, to steer COVID relief money to election administration, led by the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. They say private philanthropy stepped in to, uh, into the breach. An assortment of foundations contributed tens of millions of dollars. Many people might not know this, but there was a big complaint from some Republicans that Mark Zuckerberg was funding a ton of this personally. Facebook, I believe, well, I'm, I'm, actually, I, let, me, let me walk that back. I'm not entirely sure it was personal, but Mark Zuckerberg, they said, was leading the charge, providing resources in the tens to hundreds of millions for these efforts. Voting in the park. Vote mobiles. These things have been challenged, and many of the lawsuits Trump brought about were struck down on standing. The lawsuits we saw claiming impropriety or irregularity, not fraud, were thrown out on standing. Now, you can, you can argue that Trump had a bad hand and that Trump played his hand poorly. Sure. We never got a legitimate hearing on many of the issues that were brought up in sworn affidavits. Unfortunately, they're thrown out on standing. Because it seems to many people like a cabal of powerful elites were conspiring behind the scenes to prevent Trump from winning, much like Time magazine is telling us right now. The disinformation defense, they say bad actors spreading false information is nothing new. For decades, campaigns have grappled with everything from anonymous calls claiming the election has been rescheduled to flyers spreading nasty smears about candidates families. That's that's true. And that's horrible and wrong. Laura Quinn a veteran progressive operative who co-founded Catalyst, began studying this problem a few years ago. She piloted a nameless secret project, which she has never before publicly discussed, that tracked disinformation online and tried to figure out how to combat it. One component was tracking dangerous lies that might otherwise spread unnoticed. Researchers then provided information to campaigners or the media to track down the sources and expose them. The most important takeaway from Quinn's research was that engaging with toxic content only made it worse. When you get attacked, the instinct is to push back, call it out, say it isn't true. But the more engagement something gets, the more the more the platforms boost it. The algorithms read that as, oh, this is popular. People want more of it. What you need to understand when you read this is that we were told over and over again that lies and smears, Donald Trump's conspiracy theories, disinformation that must be stopped was, uh, well, it was very dangerous and must be stopped. I bring you now to Mark Elias and the Democrats. Donald Trump's team had claimed repeatedly that voting machines were miscounting ballots or there were errors and ballots weren't being counted properly. That was called disinformation. Donald Trump and his allies had talked long about these voting machines, and now many of them are being sued. Well, right now we're learning that Mark Elias, a Democrat, is alleging that a Republican won due to voting machines improperly reading ballots. The National Review says, now there is just one remaining unresolved House election involving another Republican woman, Claudia Tenney, in upstate New York's 22nd district, whom Elias is trying to bar from the House despite a 122 vote lead over Anthony Brindisi. And guess what Brindisi's theory in court is? Quote, in this case, there is reason to believe that voting tabulation machines misread hundreds, if not thousands of valid votes as undervotes, and that these tabulation machine errors disproportionately affected Brindisi. This is an election. Uh, this is, as election lawyers not involved in the case, note, far fetched, but it is enough of a pretext for Brindisi to file an appeal based on a voting machine's stole my election theory. Remember when they said that Donald Trump was lying about this, and now they're using the same argument? It's not the first time, apparently. We, uh, Mark Elias, did something similar in Iowa recently. We are hearing now that much of what Trump claimed, the Democrats are claiming themselves, and here it is. What we're reading from Time magazine is them telling us exactly what they've done. It's being framed by Time as though noble heroes were stopping disinformation. But if you sift through the propaganda, the story is simple. Partisan elites, not necessarily just on the left, but mostly with power and access to industry and their allies in tech and big tech suppressed information, made sure you didn't know what was going on and then changed the rules to make sure Donald Trump would lose. They go on to mention research, spreading the word, and they, they outright show the people who are absolutely involved. 
people power, the racial justice uprising, the movement for black lives. The best way to ensure people's voices were heard, they decided, was to protect their ability to vote. Strange bedfellows. They talk about never Trumpers, Republican officials who were joining with 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 Democrats, showing up, standing down. Election night began with many Democrats despairing. Trump was running ahead of pre-election polling. He absolutely was. In many states, he won. There were strange anomalies. There were many things that needed to be adjudicated that did not get adjudicated. YouTube will ban you if you make certain claims about voter fraud and irregularity. Now, I don't think we need to make any claims. I'm actually mildly perturbed by people who make YouTube videos asserting what they know to be true. Like what I mean is, were there irregularities? Yes, there were. Bill Barr claimed there was fraud. He said they just not, did not see enough that would have changed the outcome of the election. There were many things that people brought up that I cannot say had been adjudicated to a point where we can determine what they were. I can say, however, that many people have opinions based on what they've read, and they're allowed to. My, my reaction to, say, videos being released showing vans pulling up at certain uh, at the TCF center is not that I know what it was, and I'm not going to say what it was, just that a curious individual might want to investigate what that was. And if we want accountability and justice, we should get to the bottom and, and explain these things. There should be some kind of uh, assessment when we see these uh, stories and irregularities, uh, maybe, maybe not necessarily a commission. You know, we've seen Democrats call for some kind of 9-11 style commission, you know, looking over the election. But maybe when someone makes a claim and there's video evidence, we should at least say, we looked into this. Here's our initial report. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening. And it's not going to happen. Why? Well, it's, it seems reasonable to suggest that uh, a cabal of powerful elites conspired to prevent these things from being adjudicated properly. At least that's the way it's seen. That's the way it seems. My opinion is maybe there was fraud. Like, uh, you know, what I'm saying is I've personally seen evidence of irregularity potential fraud. That's actually how Matt Brainerd described it. He was the one who uh, he was with the Voter Integrity Project, and he's the one who did the research. I've seen this. I believe it's all potential, but not been adjudicated to the point where I can give you a definitive assessment. The issue is it was all shut down with no opportunity for hard assessment, and that's going to lead to destabilization. It's going to lead to widespread doubt. So probably what we would need is a fair assessment and a breakdown of what this stuff was. We needed to go to courts and we need to be able to talk about it. Well, now we can see that even after all of this, big tech is preventing these conversations from happening. News stories are being suppressed. YouTube channels are being deleted. Individuals on Twitter and Facebook have been shut down completely. And it's going to lead to much more rage. And it's going to get worse. They talk about the liberal alliance. They talk about the word going out to protect the results. And, you know, I think you, you, you get the point. They even show when Trump supporters showed up trying to observe the vote counting process because there were widespread complaints that people weren't allowed to observe the vote counting process. And that's true. We can see here they boarded they boarded up the windows. They put up posters and cardboard so people couldn't see. And then what does Time magazine say? Trump supporters seek to disrupt the vote count. We're in trouble, my friends. We're, we're, we're in trouble. The Democrats are currently using the same tactics as Trump did. And I'm not sure it will work. It's far fetched. But claiming that vote machines changed the outcome. We know that there are powerful elites manipulating the system and they're admitting to it. And we're supposed to cheer them on. I'm horrified at what this country is becoming. The New York Times is advocating for private messaging apps to be shut down because misinformation can spread. What they're really saying is that individuals can communicate. We've all been locked down due to this pandemic and we can't communicate with each other. Meanwhile, the platforms by which we communicate are censoring those who say things that they don't like. I think it's worse than Time Magazine lets on. I think it's way, way worse. And I think most of us know it's, wor- it, it's, it's that bad. And I don't know where this goes, but I'll leave it there. The next segment will be tonight at 8 p.m. over at youtube.com slash timcast IRL. We'll be live discussing much of this. Thanks for hanging out, and I will see you all then.